Introduction to Clinical Medicine by Professor Tate, 2003 Nobel Laureate for Chemistry. The lecture is organized by Thailand Research Fund, Thai Academy of Science and Technology, and Faculty of Science in the University, and the Bridges Dialogue Towards the Culture of Peace Program, supported by International Peace Foundation. First of all, I would like to invite Professor Yewat Bunlong, Director of Thailand Research Fund, to deliver an opening address. Region. 
uh, as a backpacker, and it's been many weeks uh, around this region. I was asking him at lunch, uh, how, was he back before then? We thought then and here, it was uh, 30 years, we must be. He said, it, it's, and during the trip that he took during going to Laos, Angkor Wat, uh, uh, Cambodia, Pakistan, and other places in Asia, I think, make him uh, a well traveled person. So uh, we welcome him back again. This time, a little bit different from backpacking uh, visit uh, a few years back. This time, he was treated uh, hopefully quite well by uh, our host here, Mr. Christian. So uh, welcome back again to Thailand. And I do hope that the next time you come will not be as long a space before the first time in this time that, that you visit us. Uh, we do very much uh, look forward to enjoy your lecture. Uh, we hope that uh, everyone will uh, be able to gain something from this lecture. I'm sure that <laughs> being an excellent lecture as it is, uh, we will certainly learn a lot from this lecture. So please welcome uh, our Nobel laureate for 2003, Professor Peter Abra, who will give a lecture on Upward Foreign Water Channels. Professor Peter Adler, please. Well, thank you for the gracious introduction and, and for the, the uh, splendid hospitality. Uh, I'm, I'm so happy to be here today. Uh, amongst your distinguished faculty, your, your dignitaries, and the wonderful young people here at Mahidol University. So I have many to thank. The, the university itself, Mahidol, the International Peace Foundation, the Dialogues Program, uh, for the organization of this, and the, the Thai Science Fund, which contributes precious dollars to special research activities here in Thailand. I think Thailand is very special, particularly in the region, Southeast Asia, but I think as, as the years go by, the, the role of Thailand in silence will grow. We have, over the years, had a number of one, wonderful young Thais come to Johns Hopkins, and I, I think the, the roles that you play in science worldwide will be increasingly important. So the topic of my talk today, the aquifer and water channels, is something that um, our laboratory has been pursuing now for about 15 years. Think for a moment about your own body. It's primarily water. Science students all know this. I think the general public forgets about this. I'm a 75 kilogram man. Uh, about 50 kilograms of that are water. Water is the most abundant uh, component of all of the cells and all of the tissues of my body. And the same is true of each of you. Most organisms are, or I should say, organisms are mostly composed of water. This is true of higher animals, lower vertebrates, invertebrates, microorganisms, and plant, plants. They're mostly water. And so water is oftentimes referred to as the solvent of life. Without water, there is no life. Now complex organisms will move fluids from one compartment to another. And this is essential. Think for a moment. If a foreign body lodges in the outer surface of your eye, you will almost be secrete tears to wash it clear to keep it from damaging your cornea. If you're challenged with temperature, high temperature, you will sweat to cool your body. Constitutively, the choroid plexus in your brain releases spinal fluid, which is primarily water. Our kidneys will concentrate a large volume of primary urine to the small volume of urine that we release each day. And these, these physiological functions are familiar to all of us. Other organisms also use these water channel proteins, microorganisms, to avoid osmotic shock, freeze damage, plants to take up water from the ground to release water into the atmosphere. So the proteins I'm going to tell you about, the aquaporins, really function very simply as a cellular equivalent to a plumbing system. They allow water to cross barriers to move where it needs to go. Now, when we, we became uh, interested in, the, in these studies, we had the tremendous advantage 
of joining a field that had been looked at for, for a number of decades by very, very distinguished and very dedicated biophysicists and physiologists. And they considered the problem of moving water across cell cell boundaries. But of course, it is the, uh, the plasma membrane, the outer surface of the cell, that pro provides the primary barrier of moving water across biological compartments. And it was predicted correctly in the 1920s when the lipid bilayer, so this is meant to represent a lipid bilayer, you see the, the polar heads of phospholipid molecules, the hydrophobic tails, and then here is the second leaflet, the hydrophobic tails associated with polar heads. So we have the outer surface of a cell, the inner surface of the cell, and it was, it was predicted correctly that water could diffuse back and forth, forth across these membranes. Now the dedicated biophysicists that I mentioned saw the problem with a greater clarity because they thought, well, diffusion may explain the movements in many tissues, but it doesn't explain the movements in tissues that have massive water permeability, such as renal tubules, secretory glands, and red cells, or in, in other species, for example, plants, the rootlets of the plants to move water rapidly. And so they predicted correctly that there must be water selective channels. We now know these as the aquifer water channels. And the current view is that both pathways exist. Diffusion, diffusion in all tissues, water channels in special tissue. There are some functional differences. Diffusion is a low capacity, bidirectional event, whereas water channels have a high capacity for water and very limited movement of other solutes. No detectable movement of protons, acid, in the form of the hydronium and the HBO plus. And this function of this difference is quite important because our kidneys will reabsorb up to about 180 liters of water per day from the primary urine. If we didn't reabsorb this, we would die of dehydration. If we reabsorb water plus acid, we become systemically acidotic. So these, these distinctions are quite important. But the movement of the fluid is directed by the osmotic gradients. So water either enters cells or leaves cells depending on the direction of the gradient. So this process of osmosis that we all learned about when we were young, youngsters in, in, in primary school, in biological tissues, but osmosis occurs very rapidly because of the water channel. There's some other physical differences that are known in inhibitors of, of the diffusion event, whereas Robert Macy at the University of California in 1970 discovered that mercurials would inhibit water channels. Removal of the mercurials restores the activity of water channels. It has a lower radius activation energy. So they knew a lot about the behavior of the channels in native membranes, but most scientists did not believe they existed because no one had identified water channel proteins, isolated them, cloned them, expressed them, and studied them. The proof of their existence is what caused most scientists to be skeptical that they really existed. And our laboratory played a, played a, a role in the discovery of these. And this, this role, it, it, it should be stressed to the students, was the role of sheer serendipitous observation, a sheer accident. I'm originally a, a hematologist. I was trained in internal medicine. And, and was studying the Rh blood group antigen. Now, Rh antigens are very important clinically. I suspect that every, every woman in the audience knows about Rh because of the importance they play in pregnancy. Rh negative mothers, if they become pregnant with an Rh positive baby, and about 15% of you are Rh negative, could become sensitized. Very fundamental. In the, in the years when we started these studies, about 15 years ago, the RH was not understood at a molecular level. And we developed a method to biochemically purify RH, a 32 kilodal polypeptide. And what we have here is a sodium dodecyl sulfate polyacrylamide gel. Samples are applied to the top. Electrophoretic currents draw them in, they're stained with silver reagents. Now, first off, we purified this protein from human red cells. We found I, a very similar proteins in rat and cow and other species. So, the core polypeptide of RH is fundamental. The antigen is something special for some humans. Now, by surprise, we purify a second protein of almost the same size, 28 kilodons, just a little different. And we initially dismissed this as a proteolytic fragment, a breakdown product. But that was, that was incorrect. We, uh, it, was a, it was a day that sort of changed things. 
the university president even came over to see me that day. I had no, I had no idea we were such good friends. <laughs> the uh, telephone voicemail was jam-packed with requests for interviews. And then I came through the voicemail from a familiar voice of one of my colleagues from Norway. And I'll never forget his voice. He said, Peter, Peter, we've just heard the news. It's unbelievable. <laughs> and the voice came back on and said, oh, no, 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 it's very believable. It was wonderful. <laughs> Based on now the confidence of your colleagues. Well, let me thank you for, for being president of my lecture. And let me thank my hosts for inviting me to be here. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. And let me just restate what I've said before. I think Thailand is a young country with a brilliant future. And the young people, you're, you, those of you sitting here, are really the future of science. Don't give up. It's probably the most fun career you could possibly pursue. Thank you. So that water transport might be very important, particularly in the gastrointestinal tract. But as far as massive movements of water, it's, it's, it's a relatively smaller amount. So I, I think the, the studies that you, you just described are probably going to be very important. Um, macular degeneration, retinal tears, loss of, loss of vision are a horrible problem. And uh, maybe some of these studies will provide new insights that could result and the prevention of vision loss. Wouldn't that be important? Thank you for your question. Yeah, yes, sir. You mentioned, you mentioned about the um, transport, the, uh, the uh, transport of free throw uh, to the airport, uh, free throw for it. And uh, I was wondering, uh, has the, the work been done on the uh, transport of other alcohol, such as methanol and ethanol, and can they have to this aquaporic like protein? So the question, can the alcohol permeate aquaporins? Um, my, my, we, we looked carefully at the problem of methanol transport, methanol being structurally closer to water than any other chemical. and. Uh, the problem with alcohol studies is that uh, the, the, the baseline permeation through the lipid bilayer is very high. So the diffusion pathway for, for methyl alcohol is enormous. And we can't see an incremental increase in oocyte studies, for example, where we add methyl, methyl alcohol uh, or add aquaporin RNA. Uh, so, so we simply can't do the measurement. My sense is, in fact, alcohols freely permeate aquaporins. We just can't make the measurement. Now, polyol transport is a different thing. Of course, glycerol is a polyol, uh, ethylene glycol. Uh, the baseline permeation of these molecules is much lower and can be boosted enormously by the presence of the aquaglycerolporins, up to four carbons, I guess. Uh, and after that, things spun, stop. So I think I think your thinking is right on that the, the baseline permeation prevents us from making a measurement. Thank you. Other other questions? Yes, yes, behind you. So for so I'd like to ask for APQ, APQ1. Yeah. I'd like to ask for APQ1. Okay. And then you, one of your slides you mentioned for the proton, uh, for the prevention of the proton uh, conduct. And can you, you say one of the barriers is uh, side restriction and then I get forward static repulsion. So my question is, I said, have you been, have you confirmed uh, for the slide director you purchased? Change that uh, history and actually to something else and then see the effect? A very knowledgeable question are the specific residues in the narrow part of the channel, each essential for the, for the repulsion of protons. And uh, some studies have been done in direct immunogenesis, not in all home water, but in AQP1, uh, we're unable to replace the asparagines by anything else and get a functional molecule. Now, we failed to be able to do this. It may be that other combinations of mutations can be done. Um, my sense is, 
this is such an important part of the molecule and the folding is so tight that the expression of most mutants will, will be unsuccessful. The folding will prevent their normal trafficking into the membrane. So I suspect that these molecules, th these residues are essential, but I can't prove it by mutagenesis. Now maybe you have information. Have you, in your studies, tried this? And I just asked for the histidine one day, yeah, the, the, yeah. the antigen, the sure. one that you refer for this uh, side, yeah. uh, side restriction, and then let those stand to the caution. Mm -hmm. The first barrier, yeah, so the, the second barrier, mm -hmm. the first barrier. So, so the first so barrier have, is an arginine and a histidine. And actually, and histidine. Yeah. So I'm thinking back into the gloomy recesses of my brain for studies we've done some years ago, and I have not come up with the answer. Uh, the arginine is essential, and, and with very few exceptions, arginines are present in all homologs. Uh, if I recall correctly, some of the plant tonoplast membranes, now these are intracellular membranes, where pH gradients are not known to occur, some of these membranes may lack that arginine. And physiologically, the, the importance of the plasma membrane of the plant cell, of course, is critical. Since the, the proton ATP is the electrochemical bear, uh, gradient maker. Um, but I don't have more insight than that. Uh, my second question is probably uh, rather crazy. Uh, uh, Compared to the APQ1 yeah. and the APQ9 or the equal pixel of coin. So I did wonder again for the selectivity. Yeah. Would it be possible to change those of residue and then change yeah. the selectivity? Is there anyone done that? Yeah, there has been a um, suggestion that a couple of these residues could be changed um, so that an aquaporin could be in an aquaviscerporin or the reverse. There's a group in France that reported this in uh, homologs from insects. But when we attempted to do this with, with bacterial and human proteins, uh, we couldn't express them. So, in addition, these, these proteins are not identical. Orthologs between species are virtually identical. Aquaporin 1 from human tissues and from rat tissues are more than 90% identical. But aquaporins 1 and 2 are only about 30% identical. And aquaporins 1 and 9 are probably about 20% identical. So some functional residues are perfectly conserved and others aren't. So that close enough for, for intelligent exchange. But now that we have the structures, some of these studies could be done. And I encourage people to jump in on these aquaporins and do the studies. My lab is a small lab. We're only going to pick a few years to work on it. And I think it's important that others work on this. Because even though big labs are moving in, you feel like, well, they've answered the questions. Mistakes occur. And I would have to say that I, I regret that our field has had more than its share of mistakes in the literature. And I think this is a very clear-sighted uh, question that should be answered. Uh, I hope you or others will do that. <laughs> is, is it time for another question? Yes, please. I'm Tom Han from Medical Chemistry. I would like to know about the regulation of uh, control of uh, this channel. You mentioned one thing that uh, the Relation uh, lead to trafficking of the channel to the membrane. Are there other regulations that switch on, switch on, open or close the channel? Thank you. So, excellent question. Regulation is there a, a gating mechanism to aquaporin? I think the most advanced information is coming from the plant investigators. In particular, uh, Per Schalborn and his colleagues from Lund, Sweden have made some very interesting observations. Um, so some information is unpublished. I, I, I can't in a public say, uh, setting reveal it because it would be privileged. But I think they have very clear evidence that in plant plasma membrane aquaporins that, that gating does occur. Phosphorylation of specific residues. And these residues don't appear to be important in mammalian channel gating. But in plants, it, it appears to be a good way of regulating their, their, their open and shut probability. Now one of the problems with measuring gating is water is electrically silent. Expression of water channels cannot be measured by patch clamp analysis. 
to measure rapid flickering of ion channels. The one homolog that does contain ion conduction properties is aquaporin 6. I, I have not presented that this afternoon because it's a little complicated. But it has a, a large anion formation. And this is work of Masato Yasui, who is presently at Johns Hopkins. He's a Japanese national investigator. And it looks like aquaporin 6 has a rapid flickering. But as far as we know, there's no phosphorylation dependent. It's a pH uh, uh, induced gating event with specific residues playing an important role. So I think your question is right on the mark. And I think more work needs to be done. Thank you. Over on the, the far side, please. Thank you, enjoy your talk. And actually, my question just have same as uh, what Ajahn Dohuan just asked you. But what I would like to look at is about the ATP5 to the uh, straight brain. Think about the regulation of the estrogen and the correlation because in the menopausal woman, they will have a nice sweating. And usually with the aging, you should have a decline or the down regulation of the or expression of the uh, the upper but in this case, it seems like you have the upper Sure, so, uh, fine question. Um, I think there are age dependent expression differences in upper borns. I think that's quite clear. I, I believe uh, the known concentration defect after age 50, I find I can't sleep through the night, I have to get up in the middle of the night to empty my bladder. <laughs> it's probably an underexpression of aquaporin too. Now, the question related to, to perimenopausal sweats, the, the hot flashes. Um, as far as I know, the biology has not been worked out in terms of aquaporin participation. But in, in terms of the gland functions, of course, they're involved. There's no question that aquaporin 5 is involved. But it is likely that the physiological basis, of course, is an adrenergic phenomenon, where the, the, the triggering and the control mechanisms are too tightly wired in some way. And so it, it may be that aquaporins are, are important components of this, but as far as I, I know, it's not been established. But you know, this is an important question. As I, I, I become uh, middle-aged, my sisters, my wife, uh, the wives of my friends, they're all in this, this age group where these, these processes are really quite important. The importance of bone reabsorption, or of osteoporosis, is of course of tremendous clinical consequences because millions of women around the world at, at, at the perimenopausal uh, stage of life start to develop increased bone reabsorption, which can lead to fractures and severe disability. And that is a problem that we're intensely curious about because aquaporin 9, which is a glycerol transporter, is present in the osteoplasts. And that may play a role in the bone reabsorption of, of the menopausal situation. I don't have other information. Thank you. Yes, right, right underneath there. Hi. Could you see the lecture right here down there? This is why the aquaporin is the alpha helix transmembrane domain form the four. Just to my knowledge, all the porin is in the viral. So, so the, the porin, P-O-R-I-N, bacterial porins, which are outer membrane channels or beta channels, aquaporins are unrelated to bacterial porins, just as albumin is unrelated to ovalbumin. They sound the same. The, the structures of the aquaporins are largely alpha helix, but the pore itself is, contains uh, alpha helix and, and red oil, so-called random. Uh, it's not totally random, of course. So the actual pore itself is part alpha helix, but beta, beta structures are, 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 are not present in, in, in any significant amount in aqua pores. Thank you for making that important distinction. Are we running out of questions? I think uh, I'm somewhat an older person to ask. <laughs> Oh, you talk about the raw ADH. You're not older unless you're older than me. Well, you talk about the raw ADH in terms of the, the uh, activating insertion of the uh, A2, I think, into collecting acts. Uh, what about the, the expression, the 
heart regulation and down regulation. Uh, that's an ADA temporary controlling the amount. Uh, it should be do in the sales. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you for asking that. Um, in my discussion of Aqua 4 and 2, I, I, I kind of mentioned the trafficking from the intracellular side to the surface. And then I talked about some clinical states where they're overexpressed and underexpressed. But chronic thirsting of all animals, normal humans, leads to increased capacity to absorb urine. And this is known to lead to overexpression of the aquaporin 2 protein. So, um, in fact, this chronic thirsting does alter the expression of the protein. Probably water, the compulsive water drinker, Individuals who are known not to be able to concentrate the urine, even when you take the water away, at least acutely, are probably underexpressing the approach. So those are examples of where expression levels change. Now, I think in terms of other aquaporins, expression levels are probably where we can deliver some pharmacological benefits. Right now, when, a, when a, a, an expectant mother undergoes um, premature labor, seventh month labor, for example early third trimester labor. They can pharmacologically slow down or stop labor in many cases, but not in all cases. When it's clear that they can't stop the premature labor, these women are injected with glucocorticoids because it's known that the unborn, the premature infant, once born, has a lot of very serious handicaps, one being lung function, other being vulnerability to uh, central nervous system hemorrhage. And some of these consequences are in part ameliorated by empirical glucocorticoid treatment. Now work of Landon King, I showed you a picture of Dr. King. In fact, he's, he's in the back row on the left there, um, who is a lung specialist, has shown that, in fact, expression of aquaporin 1 in lung is, is exquisitely sensitive to the presence of glucocorticoids. So that's another situation where glucocorticoids can lead to increased expression. So as, a, as an asthmatic takes a, a glucocorticoid inhaler, presumably that's one of the benefits. So thank you, that's a very good question. And, and all members of the audience are welcome to ask questions. Yeah, yes, yes please, young lady. Excellent question. Is it possible to um, reduce expression of aquaporin for a brain or induce it? Now, I gave you kind of the, the first analysis. Aquaporin 4 is important in, in the fluid movement into brain substance during the appearance of brain edema. But aquaporin 4 is also the mechanism for, for the movement of fluid out of brain substance. So um, if we inhibit aquaporin 4 at the exact time of brain injury, we could theoretically at least diminish the chance of brain edema. But once the edema has been uh, occurring, if we inhibit the aquaporin 4, then it's problematic because we can't move the fluid back out of the brain. So it's again a, a, an experimental approach to drug therapies, but in fact it will be very a very uh, a tricky type of procedure because aquaporins don't distinguish between water going one direction or the other. If the gradient is pointed this way, the water goes this way. If the gradient is the other direction, it goes the other direction. Glycerol is a little different. The glycerol can, can be captured within cells by glycerol kinases. You can phosphorylate glycerol. So you can, you can bring glycerol across membranes against the, uh, the glycerol gradient by phosphorylation. But water, we can't do that. So in fact, uh, you, you brought out an important point. There, there are going to be some, some, some problems with aquaporin for inhibition. One, one thing I didn't touch on in the lecture, I guess you haven't told me I can't talk for it. If aquaporin 4 is deleterious in the setting of brain edema, why do we have the protein at all? And this is turning out to be a very interesting subject. 
number of investigators uh, are looking at this. Our colleagues in Norway, Dr. Otterson, Malmo, Gamiri, Arlen Nagel, as well as Jeff Manley and his group in California. And what they're finding is that the aquaporin four is needed for for the fluid movement to move potassium during potassium siphoning. So neural activation, potassium is leaving neurons. It's then taken up by glial cells. But it's taken up as part of a, of, a, of a fluid, potassium along with water. So the, so the potassium channels move potassium out of the parenchyma into the astroglial cells. And the aquaporins move water. And in the aquaporin for null, or excuse me, we haven't looked at those, those we don't have access to those mice. But in the mistargeted aquaporin for mice, they, uh, they do better with regard to brain edema, but when they have epileptic seizures, the seizures are more severe. And this vulnerability to seizures, I think, is the reason the protein is present. And that's being looked at by others. Even a recent human study, which we just published, in collaboration with workers at Yale and in Norway, uh, our Norwegian colleagues, have found that in mesial temporal lobe epilepsy of humans, the sclerosis of, of the CA1 region of the hippocampus coincides with an underexpression and a mislocalization of aquaporin 4. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, those are very good questions. You know, that, that's the problem. They get up in front and, and the smart people are down there. <laughs> They're the ones that have the good questions. Uh, if not, uh, there's a couple of things that I need to, uh, to do. Inform before Professor Yon and I coming up uh, to do the official closing. Professor Yon got Thai, of course, is the president of Thai Academy of Science and Technology. I have to read because it's a long name. Not Yon Thai is a short name, but these institutions is a very long name. Um, I think uh, our audience must agree with me that uh, uh, Professor Peter Everett's lecture is both uh, believable as well as wonderful. <laughs> um, uh, I think uh, he has shown us a lot, and then we have played a lot. Uh, actually, I was thinking throughout this lecture, um, separating 28K and 32K is not difficult. Yeah. It was in blue as well as Sebastian, also not difficult. Is it? No. <laughs> Expression, you know, size is not difficult. So perhaps winning Nobel Prize is not difficult. <laughs> Thank you very much.